Welcome to the Delight Your Marriage podcast. You're joining me, Bella Rose, as I dive deep into the beauty, power, and truths about intimacy. Learn not only the practicals, but the heart behind what making love is all about. Delight your marriage. Hi there, and welcome. I'm Bella Rose, and you're joining the Delight Your Marriage podcast. And on this episode, I want to specifically talk about half-truths. Because the point of the matter is a half-truth is actually often more dangerous than a flat-out lie. Because the thing about a half-truth is it sounds a lot like the truth. I mean, it sounds like you're dealing with something that is accurate. And so you kind of open your mouth for the good and you ingest poison at the same time. And so what I want you to think about is not just that uh, these things probably ring true a little bit, but see if you can pick out the areas that are not accurate. I think that'll be really important as we go through this conversation together. And I hope that it blesses you and it actually helps you to discern truth when you hear somebody giving you part of it. So let's dive in. All right, so let's go ahead and just start with the assumption that everyone doing the work they're doing around sexual intimacy and around marriage, they're trying to help marriages stay together. They're trying to help husbands and wives love each other better. And so that's the assumption I want to give every marriage professional, myself or anyone else, they're just trying to help others. And so I'm certainly going to be charitable with anyone who said anything near uh, similar to what I'm going to share here, but I really want you to hear it because if you don't hear what I believe to be really important truth, you may be following something that's not actually going to help your marriage and not going to actually help your family. So if that's our goal, is to make marriages more healthy, more safe, more able to do God's will, then that's where, that's where we're starting from. So when I think about um, a half-truth, I would say that men and women are equal, which is absolutely true, but the half I haven't said which is very important, is we are unique. We are equal, but unique. We're not the same. And that's really important for us to remember as followers of Jesus, because if I'm exactly the same as my spouse, and I treat my husband the same as me, we're going to wind up with a lot of mess, because my husband is not the same as me. He is not seeking the same things as me. You know what? The man that I am honored to call my husband, he looks different. He smells differently. He sounds differently. He feels differently. He has very different um, uh, hair patterns. Yes, of course, genitalia. But why, 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 why do we think that all of that is different? And yet on the inside, we're, we think the same, we have the same emotions, we have the same desires. No, 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 no. We have to really, really realize that we are very, very different than our spouse. So equal, <laughs> but unique. All right. The next half truth, again, is from very well-meaning individuals who want to help marriages. So What I've essentially heard is that um, women are told that they must have sexual intimacy with their spouse. Otherwise, he's going to stray. And it's a half truth because that's a biblical notion. It's a biblical notion. Paul says that each man should have his own wife, each wife her own husband, because sexual immorality 
is so rampant. It says it's better to get married than to burn with passion. So I think it's important for us to realize that this is not a man-made mindset. This is a mindset of the living God who created your genitalia. And at the end of all of that, when he made 8,000 nerve endings in your wonderful clitoris, dear wife, or 4,000 nerve endings in wonderful member, dear husband, God was the one that designed all of that. He designed all of your um, aspects of your body to, to do all sorts of cool things when aroused. But that's not anything other than God's design. The enemy has tried to pervert that in many, many terrible ways, but it's actually God's design. So I just want to encourage you to recognize that, um, yes, a wife shouldn't feel compelled or pressured to make love. I talk about that very, very frequently on my, on my podcast and in my coaching. And the truth is that at the same time, he was designed for his sexual yearnings to be filled in his marriage. These sexual yearnings were designed by the living God. He didn't make that up. So that's the second half truth, if you will. And I hope that that clarifies some things that um, we as wives, we are not um, responsible for our husband's fidelity. We're not. At the end of the day, I give that to Jesus. I, my husband could stray at any time, <laughs> anywhere he could do that. My job though, is to look Jesus face in the face and say, I sought to love my husband well, based on, I'm trying to hold up my Bible, where is it? Somewhere nearby, um, but based on the word of God. God's the one that designed sexual intimacy for my joy, for my pleasure, and for my husband's joy and his pleasure, and ultimately to unify us so that absolutely nothing could separate us as a, as a couple, as a unified couple. You know, I was talking to a mentor friend of mine just the other day, and she's just full of wisdom. <laughs> it's so wonderful to be able to talk to her. But um, one thing she said that I really appreciated was, and she just has all these brilliant thoughts all the time, but one thing I loved that she said uh, just in the midst of our conversation is that sexual intimacy is actually meant for us to not see the foibles of our spouse. It's actually meant to help us erase all of the, uh, the stuff that is really not that great about our spouse. And so it's uh, a gift from the Lord to engage in sexual intimacy, to then be glued together. And I probably don't even have to tell you that the level of peace and ease and comfort that happens in a marriage when sexual intimacy is generous and consistent and frequent. Um, it's obvious there's a warmth in the home. I would say the next half truth is duty sex is bad. Now, duty sex is just a term that some people use to, to talk about when a wife doesn't want to make love, but she makes love anyway. She kind of forces herself and she kind of has this get it over with attitude. He needs this, so get over it. Um, or maybe he'll be mopey for the next couple of days or whatever, he'll be grumpy. Any of those things. Duty sex is not, and I would say, yes, that's, that's a half truth, absolutely. It's not the best. I don't want wives to be lying there just enduring uh, this, what's meant to be a gift. So what's wrong with duty sex? Is duty sex an issue that the, uh, that the wife has to only make love if her body is aroused? Because the truth of the matter is if that's, if that's accurate, then I wouldn't make love very often at all. See, the way my body works and the way most women's bodies work is they choose to make love first and then their body responds. They don't uh, choose 
uh, they, they don't sit on the couch. I'll, I'll just say for me, I don't sit on the couch and decide, does my body want to make love? No, no, I'm going to stay here and lay down and not. Because the truth of the matter is that most of the time, my body is not just automatic. It's not just a inspired. It's just not. I have lots of things that I love to do in the world and intimacy I prioritize and I choose to go towards because I love my husband. That's actually the reason that I go towards physical intimacy, but it's not because I just, uh, that they call that, um, spontaneous desire, which is usually what men are, uh, versus, um, uh, what is it called? <laughs> is it called receptive desire? No. Oh gosh. It's, um, a lot of you probably listening know it. What is it called? It's, it's not reactive desire. It's like, ha, huh, I forgot the name. Anyway, the point is responsive. I think it's responsive desire. And so the point of the matter is that that's, that's more so me, but even more so than that, it's a decision. I make a decision first, and then I have all sorts of tips and tricks to get myself in the zone. But I decide first. I live according to my values first. I don't just live according to my feelings. That's not how we were meant to live as Christians. We have a whole wonderful word of God that teaches us how to live. That's right, we submit ourselves to the word of God. It's not all about our feelings, whether it's intimacy or anything else. It's not all about how we feel. For example, I, I cook dinner for my kids. Well, luckily my husband often does that for us, but um, you know, I get them ready. I, I, I serve them, I love them, I, I care for them physically, I care for them. Um, I take care of them. Is it because I just feel like it? Do I just feel like it? No, most of the time I would much prefer to do some self-centered something. I, I, don't, I don't love to, to cook. I don't love to, to clean. I don't love, I mean, these are, are normal things that most people just don't love. <laughs> but we do them for our children, obviously, because we love them. And if we love them, we take care of them in the ways that they need to be taken care of. And so that's when a wife says, I don't feel like making love right now. So how do I get myself to feel like making love? How do I get myself to have a heart that wants to love the man I was entrusted with well? That's our opportunity, is to, is to perceive our husband with wisdom and generosity of heart. How do I get to love this man well, the man I was entrusted with? So no, you shouldn't be engaging in duty sex, but that's when, wives, you have an opportunity to change your heart posture and say, this is an opportunity to take care of my first human assignment. This is not oppressive. This is a joy if I look at it that way. If I look at my mothering that way, it's oppressive that I have to serve these kids all the time. They're so annoying and I have to pray with them and I have to read a Bible to them. And oh my gosh, I have to read devotionals to, devotional to them every night and I, I have to play a board game with them. Oh my gosh. And a, a, a mother would never say such a thing with dignity and, and, and a, a, a deep sense of I'm doing the right thing by thinking these things. But unfortunately, wives, we're in a society in a moment right now where it's, it's a lot of half truths. Yes, your, your body is sacred. Yes, you should be respected. No, you should not be pressured. And there is a way to learn how to discover your own pleasure and joy and in intimacy and take care of your first human assignment which is your husband, <laughs> to be clear. It's God, your husband, your kids, and then everything else, your ministry, your work, other responsibilities, everything comes after those priorities. 
And I just want to clarify, your relationship with God is different than ministry. God comes first. Your prayer life, your interaction with him, your work for him is after your spouse and your kids. Because those are the most important commands is love your neighbor as yourself. And that follows love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and mind. So loving God first, and then after loving God is love your neighbor. And ministry, work for God, work for the kingdom, falls into that second category. So then you have to look at all the humans in your life and you have to realize my spouse is first, then my kids, then my ministry, then my commitments, then my church responsibilities, then my work responsibilities, whatever. You discern it after that. I'm just, I'm just giving examples of how you might discern it, but it's, it's God, spouse, kids, everything after that is a discernment process. And it's a season by season discernment process. So that's that half truth is, is duty sex is bad. The, the truth is duty sex is bad and the solving duty sex is changing your heart, is changing your attitude, is changing your mind. Sex is a gift. It's an opportunity to do your marriage God's way, to sow into your family, to bring peace and unity and safety into your home. And that really is a testament of the gospel. That really is every kid that comes through your home seeing a husband and wife connected and in love. Actually, somebody was just saying that, that um, there was a, it was a client was, was talking about how their, their daughter went to a, um, a sleepover somewhere else and she came home and she was like, mom and dad, you are the best married couple ever, something like that, because she saw this stark contrast between their marriage and this, th their friend's um, parents' marriage. And so I just encourage you to realize kids notice. They notice if there's strife. They notice. It, it makes them unsafe. It makes them uneasy. And yes, it is not a representation of the gospel if we are fighting. All right. My final half-truth for you is that... Um, Everybody fights. It's, it's normal to fight. It's normal to have arguments in your marriage. Uh, so that the, the truth of that is it's normal, quote unquote, and it's unbiblical. And it's unbiblical. See, we have this incredible Bible <laughs> that a lot of places in the world, even today, they will be put in prison if they are found with a Bible. And if you're listening to my voice, you likely are not in that place. But let me read to you a, a, a couple of scriptures that I think will, will speak to you um, to just confirm that this is an unbiblical, normal, quote unquote, aspect that, that even Christians think they, they, they laugh about it. Like this is a normal thing, but... This, this, is, this is a grievous, grievous aspect. Uh, it might be normal, but it's wrong. So 128 says, uh, sorry, Romans 128 says, furthermore, just as they did not think it worthwhile to retain the knowledge of God, so God gave them over to a depraved mind so that they do what ought not be done. They have become filled with every kind of wickedness, evil, greed, and depravity. They are full of envy, murder, strife, strife, strife. I said it three times that doesn't say it in the Bible, but <laughs> strife is next to murder. This is a big deal. Do you realize this? Strife, it's a big deal. Deceit, malice. Gossips, slanderers, God-haters, insolent, arrogant, and boastful. Yeah, it's just really tough. It's really tough. They have no understanding, no fidelity, no love, no mercy. Although they know God's righteous decree that those who do such things deserve death. Did you catch that? 
They deserve death. Whoa. They not only continue to do these very things, but also approve of those who practice them. That is dangerous. Let us not be in that category, please. Let us not be in that category. First Corinthians 3.3, 3, you are still worldly. For since there is jealousy and quarreling among you, are you not worldly? Are you not acting like mere humans? Second Corinthians 12, 20. For I'm afraid that when I come, I may not find you as I want you to be. And you may not find me as you want me to be. I fear that there may be discord, jealousy, fits of rage, selfish ambition, slander, gossip, arrogance, and disorder. Whew. Oh my goodness. How about Galatians 5.20? 19 and 20, the, the acts of the flesh are obvious, sexual immorality, impurity and debauchery, idolatry and witchcraft, hatred, discord, jealousy, fits of rage, selfish ambition, selfish ambition. When was the last time you had an argument because your spouse wasn't doing what you wanted them to do for you? It's embarrassing to say, I remember the last time. It wasn't that long ago. This is our opportunity. Your, your relationship and your marriage is an opportunity to grow as a human. So that you, if, if you are so, um, if you are so expert, if you will, if you're such an expert, if you're so well-trained, you're so well-disciplined to not create a big issue with your spouse when you feel wronged, that means you're really able to hold your tongue at work. You're really able to cool off, cool down and not fight um, and make a fool of yourself in, in a public scene. Like, it's really clear that we should not bring shame, that we should not bring shame on the name of God or his teachings. We want to use our marriage as the opportunity to grow so then we get to a place where we're so much better in all these other areas of our lives because we've been, we've been taught and we've grown through our marriage. So I just want to encourage you, wherever you're listening to advice on marriage, you want to be really intentional to make sure it's based on the Bible. And the sad thing is, there are people that know that the marriage advice they're getting is from someone who is not basing it on the word of God. They know it, and yet they still listen to that advice. We should not be looking like non-believers. If you are a Christian, meaning that you believe that the, that the death of Jesus was sufficient to take care of all of your sins. You didn't have to do anything other than accept Jesus' blood. As it talks about in Hebrews 10, it's very clear. You don't have to do more than that. Jesus' blood, his sacrifice, believing on him, accepting him, and then surrendering your life, following after him is sufficient. There's not more that you have to do. That is not Christianity. If you are listening to people give you advice on marriage that don't even understand what marriage actually is, it's a biblical foundational concept. We learn how to do marriage well by the Bible. I invite you to ensure, ensure that those that are teaching you in such a profoundly important area of life that they're doing it based on truth.
not a half truth, not something that sounds good in society nowadays. And we're going to just dress it up with some flavors of, of um, quotes that might sound kind of like Jesus. I just, uh, I just want to be really intentional. Be in the Bible. And you don't have to be a scholar to get more discerning. But have a physical Bible, not, not a, a screen, a physical Bible that you crack open every day. And it doesn't, it doesn't have to be really difficult. Hopefully you get to a place where you're doing more than that. Um, but it could just be uh, a couple of scriptures every day. So you get the word in you. And start with Hebrews 10. If you're not sure, whatever, wherever you're coming from, the sacrifice of Jesus is sufficient. Listening to people who don't believe that means they're not believing the Bible. And so you going towards their advice, it's dangerous. It's a dangerous thing. And I, I it, even, even my words should be tested. Even my opinions should be tested according to the word of God. So I invite you to, to take that responsibility on yourself and do that. We all have Google. We can all search to see if these things are accurate. But more importantly, you have a physical Bible. If not, just buy one. Just buy one. Get it. <laughs> it might be $30 for a nice fancy one. Otherwise, it's probably like seven. <laughs> just, just get one. Just have a physical one. Lucky you that you go to jail for holding one of those. Glory to God. Um, but yeah, we want, we want the truth to set us free in every aspect, in every single aspect, including our marriage, including our intimacy, and the way we love and take care of those that God has assigned to us. So let's pray. Father, you know this individual. You understand their heart. You know what they're going through. You know what they've been through. You understand the peculiarities of their heart and their pain. And I pray, Father, that whether it's a husband or the wife listening, that you would take care of them. You would give them a grace to trust you, that you can heal them from whatever baggage, whatever history, whatever it may be that they are dealing with. Lord, that more and more they would surrender to you and the way you prescribe for us to handle marriage and to handle humans, to be kind, to be patient, to be good. All of these things, they require us to die to ourselves, to pick up our cross and follow you, Jesus, and to not demand our own way, not to have selfish ambitions, but, but truly, truly to want the good for the other and to see how we can give the good for the other. Lord, I pray for this husband that he would have hope and he'd truly be able to love his wife and cherish her as his own body and treat her as the weaker vessel. What does that even mean? To be gentle with her, to make her safe, to not be rough and harsh in the way that he approaches her or talks with her or belittles her. No, that she's fragile. Be tender and loving. That's what she cares for. That's what she wants. And for this wife, I ask for a grace to humble herself. Right now, it's almost unpopular for women to be humble. Oh, Lord, have mercy. Oppression of women is wrong. Humility of women, the humble woman in her heart, oh, she's beautiful. No, we should not oppress women. Yes, women should be humble, just like men should be humble. We all get to humble ourselves, die to ourselves, and serve the other. I pray for both sides of this to rise up to a greater sense of purpose and doing your will better in the world. We love you, Jesus. We want to do this your way. We really love you, and we want our lives to reflect our love and our preoccupation with you, Jesus, with making you happy. <laughs> we, want, we want to look up and see your smile because we're doing it your way, Jesus. 
Amen. All righty. Well, listen, thank you so much for joining me in this conversation. And uh, I just trust that God's going to do what he needs to do in your heart and your life. And uh, we love to help you. So um, we get to help folks all around the world. And it's amazing if you've seen any of our testimonials, or transformation stories yet, um, you know it happens. And it is a gift every day to be on the inside of this and see God just do what he does and he does it. We get to give him all the glory for it. It's all based on his word. So we'd love to help you and serve you with a free clarity call. It's a, it's a gift. It, it costs um, some on our side, but we would love to give, gift that to you. Uh, just an opportunity for you to have clarity on what's really going on and why. So go to delightyourmarriage.com slash CC. Alrighty. God bless you. Have a great one.